kind of amazing. So uh, that was that was an amazing talk. If you get a chance, if you didn't go see the IoT talk, if you didn't do that, uh, definitely check it out in the video. Okay. So uh, my name is Dan Moore, and I'm going to talk about Amazon Machine Learning. So what is uh, what is Amazon, Amazon Machine Learning? We'll talk about it in a little bit. I'm going to do a demo. Uh, live coding, so please keep your fingers crossed. But first, uh, who am I? Actually, who cares? We're gonna talk about machine learning. Who here know is uh, has, knows nothing about machine learning? Who here has done a little bit of machine learning, has a little bit of experience? Who here is an expert on machine learning? Who's Jeff D? Ah. Alright, someone knows who Jeff D is. Awesome. Uh, so machine learning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of target things towards the, uh, the beginners in here. Uh, machine learning at a high level is basically just getting patterns out of data with software. So it is, uh, that's a little bit like saying an HTML page is just a place where people can type text. There's obviously a lot of tech underneath that. There's a lot of math, a lot of statistics, white papers, algorithms, a lot of PhDs. So what do you do if your boss comes to you and she says, well, I just want to predict when a customer will leave my application. Do you start getting your application ready to go back to grad school? Do you hire an expensive consultant? What do you do? Well, Amazon Machine Learning can actually help you with this problem. So it was designed by Amazon for the kind of 80% of use cases of machine learning, machine learning that they found inside their organization. So I like to think of machine learning as kind of the bobblehead compared to the terminator of general machine learning, right? It's easier, it has guardrails, it, it's very uh, beginner friendly, you don't need to write very much code. So it is supervised learning. How many people don't know what supervised learning is? Okay, so there's two main categories of machine learning there, you know, again, this is a huge area. But there's unsupervised learning where you basically just throw data at an algorithm and it figures out the structure of that data. There is also supervised learning where you provide training data which has answers that you want, right? So uh, when will this customer leave, right? Or when has this customer left might be a better way to put that. And so you have this historical data, you have customer attributes. How many times they log in, how big their company is, how many accounts they have. And then you know, oh, they were with us for six months, they were with us for two years. And so you have this corpus of data. And then you train, you put that into an algorithm, which then lets you put in uh, later at all the attributes of that customer, except for how long they were around for, and gives you an answer. So it's basically a prediction engine. So that's what Amazon Machine Learning does for you. It, it is a prediction engine. It, what it predicts against is structured CSV text, so comma separated variable text. There's little to no coding needed. Depending on how clean your data is, it can be no coding. Although I would not build a production system without coding. Uh, there's stuff around upgrading your models, getting new data into your system that you're going to want to write code for. But certainly to experiment with, you can do zero coding. It's hosted, so that means that you don't have to run any infrastructure at all. Amazon takes care of all of that. It has limited configurability, which is a plus and a minus. So what that means is that it comes with a set of sensible defaults and it lets you tweak five or six knobs. But if you don't know what you're doing, it tries to give you a good answer. It has uh, data insight. So you can actually use Amazon Machine Learning without making any predictions at all, without building any models at all. And the way you do that is you just point it to your data on S3 and then it will give you things like histograms and other data insights that you could use and could be valuable for you. If you have like this data on S3 that you don't really know what it looks like, you can point Amazon Machine Learning at it and it will give you some uh, overview of the data. And then like most AWS services, it's pay as you go. So when you aren't using it, you don't pay for it. Has limitations. I had an interesting conversation with a, a guy uh, yesterday talking about what big data is. And Amazon Machine Learning is really aimed at medium data. So your training data set is about, uh, maxes out at 100 gigs, and your uh, predictions are about a terabyte. So you can do multiple batches of predictions, but you, if you have exabytes of data, or petabytes, or even tens of terabytes that you want to train on, you're going to probably want to run your own system. You're not going to want to use Amazon, Mon, Amazon Machine Learning. 
It also doesn't let you export the model. So it's kind of this opaque black box. And in some ways that's nice, but in other ways, if you want to take your model with all the learning that you've done on it and move it to a different system, well, you're out of luck with uh, Amazon Machine Learning. Obviously, it's also only AWS. And here's some more constrictions about it. It only accepts four input data types. So that would be strings, numbers, booleans, and categorical values. So that's like one of n. And uh, it only predicts against booleans, numbers, and categorical values. So you can't use this for natural language processing or anything like that. You can read natural language in, but you cannot predict natural language. It only is in two AWS regions. Uh, one is in the EU, in case you need to worry about EU sovereignty issues, the other is in the US. And then there's only one algorithm. So you basically are forced to use stochastic gradient descent, and that's part of it being the bobblehead, right? Like, it doesn't force you to choose an algorithm. You don't have to learn about algorithms. This is just the algorithm that AWS has found works best for a large portion of their use cases. So I want to set the stage for the problem that I'm going to demo. So basically, there's sets of data out there that universities have uh, cleaned for us. Uh, thank you, universities. And I picked one. And this is basically just census data. And so it's a large number of attributes of census uh, uh, that someone might fill out on a census. It's, this person's 31 years old. They're married. They're a high school grad. and the value that we're trying to predict is whether or not they make more or less than $50,000 a year. So this is from the 90s. So I guess that was more money back then. Um, and in this case, the so, so this is our training data. So this is our data with the answers. So you can see that we have all these variables. They're also called features in machine learning, in, in the machine learning uh, domain. And then our last one, which it doesn't have to be the last one, you just have to pick one, is that true value in the red. So that is, this, this person makes more than $50,000 a year. We obviously have more records than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a model, and then we're going to put pass, pass in observations like this, which you'll see is everything that we had in the training data except for the, uh, the true or false value, and we're going to get back a prediction. So that's essentially what we're doing here. So before I go into the demo, I want, I'm going to talk about the uh, data pipeline, and I'm going to go into a demo, and I'm going to talk about where AWS machine learning is a good fit, but I do want to talk about the ethics of it. So this is something that is, I mean, ethics are important with technology in general, right? I hope I don't have to, I hope I don't have to prove that, but I think with machine learning, it's even more important because when you're building software, you're building something that somebody can interact with, right? And they could definitely do things that are bad, right? Like send spam. But when you're building models, you're often building systems that are going to um, act on people. Right, they're going to make decisions about people's lives. And so things you want to think about are training set bias. Right? If I am building a model about fitness or health, and I only have data within like one state, but I want to scale it to the entire United States, I wouldn't want to pick, uh, say, Colorado, right? because that's it's the fittest state, um, or Mississippi. No, 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 I hope no one's offended if, I pick Miss, if I'm wrong about Mississippi. But you don't want to pick a uh, misrepresentative example. So training set bias is very important. The other thing to think about, and this is a framework I drew from Weapons of Mass Destruction, which is a fantastic book that anyone who works with machine learning should absolutely read. It's uh, not a technical one at all. It just talks about the ethics of it. You want to think about the opacity, scale, and damage of your model as it's used. So opacity is how transparent is the model in terms of its inputs and how the outputs are fed back in to become inputs. So baseball is an example that she, the author uses. Yeah, that's a very transparent system. You know, people are building models about baseball, but it's very clear what we're targeting for, right? We're targeting for winning games. And everyone has access to the same data. And it's often like, as soon as the game finishes, it's fed back into the model. Uh, something like what the model that my insurance company uses to charge them to, to figure out my healthcare premium is an example of an opaque model, right? I don't have any idea what goes into that, and uh, I don't know anybody who really does. Scale is an important thing to think about. If you are building a model just for your company, then that is, uh, you know, doesn't affect that many people. If you're building a model that could scale to your state or your country, that's gonna affect people. 
you also want to think about what your scale is in the future, not just what your scale is right now. And then finally, the damage. Like, what damage can your model do when it's incorrect? Because all these models are going to be incorrect some portion of the time, right? This is statistics. This is not logic. And so, when it's wrong, is it wrong in that it shows someone a, an ad for a car that they probably don't want to buy? Well, that, that's a pretty small amount of damage, right? Like, it's a little bit of annoyance. Is it going to deny them a car loan? Well, that's a bigger thing, right? So you want to think about this kind of thing when you're building your machine learning system, right? You are not allowed to not think about this kind of thing in my mind. All right, so let's not think about this kind of thing anymore. Boy, tough crowd. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about the pipeline, and now we're kind of moving into Amazon machine learning territory. This pipeline I've seen in other situations, but this is all going to be AML nomenclature. So we have our data. It's in any format. Right? It could be JSON, XML, etc. And we have a prep script. And that prep script can be written in any language. It could be Python. It could be, if you have a large amount of data, it could be a, a Hadoop job or something like that. That gets you CSV, right? Because again, we only can in, uh, ingest CSV for Amazon Machine Learning. We load it up to S3. We can also pull it out of Redshift or RDS, but I'm not going to demo that. So we have this data on S3, we go through the process of creating a data source, and now we have an AML data source. And this is like an independent entity that lives within AML. You don't have a lot of control over it, it's immutable, but you can create multiple data sources against data. So if you want to exclude certain attributes, or if you have PII or something like that, you can do that. Or if you want to play around with a model, and you, you, do a, you build a model and you realize that the age variable in this model is just garbage. So you want to exclude that. You can create another data source without modifying your source data. You take the data source, you create a model against it. Again, you can create multiple models against the same data source. So that's how you would actually test and evaluate models, is you create multiple different models. And when you create a model, you can actually evaluate that model for accuracy. And so the way you do that is you hold back some training data, which again has real world answers in it. And AML basically takes your model, it splits off the, the target variable so it knows what, uh, what the right answer should be. It runs the observation through the model and then compares it. So if it says for this observation, the answer the model came back with is true and the real world answer is true, in terms of making more than $50,000 a year, then thumbs up, that's one point for the model. If it's false, then it's thumbs down, right? So you get this score, and so that lets you evaluate different models in terms of their accuracy. You also can, once you have a model, you can do predictions. There's two kinds of predictions you can do. The first is a batch prediction, and as you guess, it's an asynchronous prediction. So you put files up on S3, you point AML at that file, it goes off and does its thing, and you pull it periodically, and you say, okay, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? And then when it's done, you can go get the answers. And so you can put up to, I think it's uh, 100 million rows. I'm not sure what the absolute number is, but a large number, right? But it's asynchronous. It will, pro it will Amazon Machine Learning will kill any uh, job that runs for longer than seven days. So you're guaranteed you'll have an answer of some kind in seven days. Or if you need an answer more quickly than a week, you can use real-time predictions. And these are one-to-one -one predictions. So you pass in, you start up a server, you pass in one uh, observation, and you get back an answer within 100 to 200 milliseconds. Again, you don't have to run the server. You can start the server up and stop it when you need to. And uh, that's one of the benefits of AMI. So this is my slide, my favorite slide. I'm going to put this in every talk I ever do because it reminds me that you can turn tools or, or you can use things for, uh, in ways that they might not be meant to be used. But I will let you know a little secret here that, that Amazon Machine Learning is machinery, right? It is, it's useful machinery. It helps take some of the complexity out of machine learning. But just like HTML, CSS, or machinery, like the art is not in AML. The art is in having clean data and having intuition about your data. And those are things that AML can help you with, but they are not things that AML will solve for you. All right, so now we're going to do a demonstration. Uh, not this kind of demonstration, but uh, all right. 
So, first we're going to look at the data. Uh, I already showed you one piece of that, but let's just look at. So you can see the raw data is up at the top there. So you can see that this person is 39. They make less than fifty thousand dollars. They're never married. We're going to do a little bit of transformation of this data. What we're going to do is, and that's, that's the lower portion here, and what I did is I put in the header values, which is going to be helpful in terms of building the model later. And I also did a translation of the value of less than or equal to $50,000, because AML only accepts certain kinds of data with for Boolean values. And by the way, all this code is up on GitHub, so you can kind of download this and play with the, the data set yourself. If you're willing to spend four dollars, because that's about what it takes to kind of run through this a couple of times. So I, I, I don't think you guys wanted to watch me load data up to S3. Uh, if you do, come talk to me later. I'm happy to, happy to show you. Uh, so we're going to jump right into machine learning. And I'm going to create a new data source. Now I do want to give the disclaimer that I'm doing this in real time, but Amazon Machine Learning takes a variable amount of time to actually do these operations. So I reserve the right to skip back to a previously generated data source or model and talk to that. So this is now looking at that data. I actually had to grant permissions to it previously. And it's going to generate a schema file, and we'll talk about what that is. But first, we're going to kind of step through all making all the data source. So uh, it asks us if the first line is uh, column names. It is far, far easier to reason about data that is age or education than it is borrow one, borrow two. So if you can put in header files, please do. This is where you would check, select the data type, right? So you can have one of the four, and AML takes its best guess, but will uh, you can override it if you want. If you are trying to train a machine learning model, you need to pick the predicted variable, right? The target variable is what they call it. You also create a data source if you're creating a batch prediction, and that obviously was full of observations and won't have a target variable. So it gives us a nice little helpful message that now we're going to use logistic regression to train a binary classification model. Again, if you're working through this for the first time, that's a great time to do some Googling. If your data contains an identifier, a row ID, then you can mark that in this uh, process. And what that does is it does two things. One is it, it's going to pass that row ID through to your batch predictions and in any log files. So if you have issues with records that are being processed, you can like identify the specific one. And also removes it from the model making process. You probably don't want a unique identifier to be part of your, your model generation process because it's not going to be super predictive because it's unique. All right, so we can review this, create the data source. All right, so I'm going to do two things on this screen. I'm going to add a tag. And this is a nice feature of Amazon Machine Learning that you can put in a tag. And what it does is that tag, the first 10 tags, follow downstream, right? So I'm going to take this data source, I'm going to make a uh, model out of this. I'm going to take make predictions out of that model. And all those are going to have this these tags on it. So if you have 10 people working in the same space, uh, or you come back to models and you revisit models, which you're probably going to want to do because there's a lot of experimentation, you can tag that all. The other thing I want to show you is the input schema. So this is just a, a JSON file. that is the representation of what we selected during the data source creation process. So this just lends itself to automatability. If you want to like save this off and 
provide this for other data sources you can. The only other thing I'd call out about this is that this excluded attribute names is something that's only available in the API usage. You can't set this via the um, UX, but if you have things that you absolutely don't want to be pulled into the data source, like personally identifiable information or something like that, you can use excluded attributes so you don't have to modify the S3 data at all because it might be read-only for you. All right. So we're still pending and I'm going to show you the results of a different data source. So here we can see the compute time and that's what we pay, that's part of what we pay for. You pay 42 cents per compute hour and you get, this is the, the distribution stuff I was talking about, right? The data and analytics that you get. So here, I see that I have about 4,000 records where I had an income greater than $50,000, 15,000 that I had less. If you have, a, this is this started about starting to build your intuition. If you have a uh, data set that has 10 records that are greater than 50,000 or, and 15,000 that have less, hands up if you think that's gonna make for a good model. No, it's not gonna make for a good model. So you need to like this is sort of like this is part of the data science, right? You're starting to experiment, you're starting to build hypotheses, you're starting to look at the data and see what makes sense and if the data is good. You can also see if you have missing values. This data being academic doesn't have any missing values. And then you can also start to look at some statistics, right? So not super in detail, but definitely more than I knew before I, I pulled this in. Right? I get to see the histogram of the ages. Um, I get to see the means, the, the ranges. So this is all about helping you build intuition. And you know, this actually can like, highlight things that need to be removed from your data set, right? I did a project where it was, uh, there was an income, uh, and there was income value, and the histogram had a really high spike on the, the left-hand side, uh, sorry, the right-hand side, you know, a very high income. And I was like, it's kind of peculiar that there's so many people making almost a million dollars a year. That's kind of weird. And then I dove into it and I read the, more about the data set and it turned out that was a marker value for people who decided they didn't want to answer the question. Now, if I just kind of blithely, you know, pulled ahead, then I would have had a really horrible model. Um, so this is definitely worth taking a look at. So let's go back to our data source. We can now create a model. So I'm gonna do this two ways. The first one I'm gonna do is the quick way, which is basically taking the default path. And again, I think this is a strength of AML that lets you get right to like making predictions. And then I'm gonna go back and do the, the custom path. And talk a little bit more about the various pieces. So again, you can see my tags are following me along. That's fun. Okay, so now I'm gonna select, I'm gonna create a custom model here. So, this is again where having, having the row names is very helpful because it lets me look at kind of some sample data. And the recipe is very similar to the schema, right? The schema maps between your data and your data source. The recipe maps between your data source and your model. So this is where you are gonna spend a lot of time experimenting because it's going to let you do things like uh, assign intermediate variables and um, form transformations on them. So what you can do here is you can look at these numeric variables and you can, in this particular case, we are binning this group of variables. So let's sorry, let me take a step back. You can group variables so that you can apply the same transformation to all those variables at the same time. And then uh, you put the, the output, the, the transformation, or you either, sorry, you either put the transformation into an intermediate variable, which you can then do other calculations on, or you can just put it right in the output. This outputs clause is the most important part of the recipe because that's what your model actually sees. 
So if I did not want my model for some reason, I didn't think that the education or, or the age were very valuable, I can remove them from this recipe and the model won't see them. So again, this is how you tweak and you can change and you can see, uh, you can build different models. Um, as far as the transformations go, there are about eight or ten transformations that they make available. Things like lower casing strings, normalizing val uh, numeric values, binning, which I had to look when I first saw it. It's basically turning a uh, real number into a categorical value. So it bins it up into a certain number of pieces. I have played around with those recipes a fair bit, and I've never been able to get something better than the default recipe. But, you know, I also was playing with very clean, very toy data sets most of the time. So here's some advanced settings. Remember when I said that limited configurability, there's only five or six knobs you can tweak. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Again, I think going with the defaults is going to serve you well 95% of the time. Uh, and then the question is, do you want to evaluate your ML model now? And that means withholding some training data, and so you're training on less data. Or if you already have an existing set of real-world data, you can point it to that. Or you can create a model without evaluating it. If you want to, you know, this is part of a pipeline and you want to evaluate all your models at one time or something like that. So again, you can change any of these settings. So this is, this is all the configuration you have to do. Or, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. This is all the configuration you're allowed to do, right? So this is, again, pointing to the fact that AML is good for a certain subset of solutions. And if you are a machine learning expert, people raise their hands, uh, you might say, well, this isn't enough. And I would say to you, well, AML is not an answer to all your problems, right? Like, there are other answers to all your problems, like 42. Um, but it can be a tool in a toolbox. All right, so let's go back to models. So this one's still in progress. Um, let's see. So I am not going to wait for this to finish because it's an indeterminate amount of time. So I'm just going to go back to a model that I built previously. And we'll look at some of these pieces. So again, you have a log file so that you can look at if you need to debug things or more likely submit to your AWS account manager, hey, why is this busted, or in the forums. Um, as far as settings, you know, this is an independent object. You can see all the choices I made or the choices that were made for me around this recipe, around the advanced settings. You can also monitor your AML model with CloudWatch. And there aren't too many metrics you can use, but the main ones that are probably interesting of interest are number of predictions and number of failed predictions. And so if you are building a production system and you're rolling out a new client and suddenly your number of failed predictions spikes, well, then maybe the client isn't passing the data the model is expecting. Evaluation is, as I kind of implied, kind of a key thing. Um, here, Amazon's going to give you, for each different type of predicted value, Amazon's going to give you kind of a baseline, which is basically saying, hey, you got to be better than this number, otherwise you should really go back and clean your data, try a different recipe, try something else. And in this particular case, this is uh, AUC, AUC stands for area under the curve, and this is a very good one. If you happen to have an area in the curve that was closer to zero, that means that uh, in this case the model is like negatively correlated, right? You, it almost gives back the opposite answer. It's like Alice in Wonderland. And you can also kind of, uh, for, for this particular prediction, where it's a zero or a one, a true or a false, you know, AML is not giving that back really. It's giving back a number between zero and one, and you, as the creative this model can determine what is enough to make something a true or make something a false. And I think that that really depends on what you're planning to do with the data, right? If you're planning to do something that's cheap, then you might want to have, you're okay with a lot more false positives, right? If you're sending an email to somebody, if you're having somebody, if you're calling somebody or sending them real mail that costs real money, 
then you may want to have fewer false negatives and more false, I'm sorry, fewer false positives and more false negatives. All right, so again, that evaluate, that AUC number is probably what you're gonna want to be looking at to determine, hey, did the change that I'm making in the re this recipe actually help the model become more accurate? Okay, if this is not done now, oh, I, I stalled for long enough, awesome. So, we're gonna actually see a prediction. <coughs> So this is, uh, oh, sorry about that. So the first thing I have to do if I want a real-time prediction is create this endpoint. It actually charges me, it's gonna warn me how much it charges me. And then I have to write this code. And this code, again, is up on GitHub. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look up the model name. And then I'm going to uh, look up the ID, the endpoint URL, then I build the observation data structure, right? So that's going to be basically just a mapping between the keys and the values for this observation. This is an 81-year-old, actually let me change that to 51. Oh my gosh, I apologize about that. That's fun. Uh, then I online uh, 22 to 26 is when I actually call out to the real-time endpoint. And then I'm going to get back a big long data structure that you can see if you look in the code. Oh wow, that's nice. Um, has, that been there the has that been there the entire time? <laughs> All right, well then I guess I'm a sponsor or I'm, I'm uh, presented to you by Air Parrot uh, and, and Windows. Um, so, All right, so now I'm going to actually run this prediction against this. For this 51-year-old male, uh, married male, does he make more, do we predict him to make more or less than $2,000? Great. Now you might say, oh, Dan, you just, you just printed that to say uh, one all the time. Let's change it to an 81-year-old. Sorry. Now it's zero, so that's false. So you saw it was quick. You obviously could do that. There's, there's, um, AWS SDK. This is just use the AWS SDK, so you can do that in JavaScript, in Ruby, in whatever language you want. Doesn't really matter. All right. So I'm going to cut the. I'm not going to do the batch prediction demo, but I, I encourage you guys to do that. I'll leave that as uh, homework. Where does AML make sense? So. It may, it's an easy intro to machine learning. I hopefully the people who didn't have any understanding of machine learning picked up something from that. And again, you can go spend a couple of bucks and work with a real data set and get some intuition for how machine learning works. Uh, little no coding, great for exploration of data. Uh, you don't, if you don't need large amounts of configuration, not, uh, if you don't want to tweak a bunch of knobs or learn how to tweak a bunch of knobs, I think AML is a really good fit. If you don't want to run infrastructure, or if you don't want to pay a lot of money. The alternatives are, within the AWS, you have some domain-specific alternatives around image recognition, voice recognition, natural language processing. There's a deep learning AMI, which is basically an EC2 instance image that you can just start up that comes preloaded with a bunch of open source tools. SageMaker, I think in some ways, Amazon didn't get a lot of traction with AML, and they actually took some of those lessons and came up with SageMaker, which incidentally, um, just after I finished like learning AML, SageMaker came out, which is awesome. Um, but that is a little more standards-based, so you can actually download the model to your uh, local computer. It uses Jupyter Notebooks, so they actually um, went a little bit more, kind of, I wouldn't say standards based because it's not blessed by authority, but a little more best practices of the industry. And then Spark ML is another option if you have a lot of data that you're running on top of, that you're having uh, EMR clusters, you can run Spark ML on top, on top of that. For non AWS options, Google, Azure, there are plenty of startups out there doing this. Um, I've heard great things about Google's machine learning solutions. And then open source, there are obviously some open source options as well. So I want to thank University of California Irvine for that data. They also provided the other data sets. Uh, I did a course on this. I wrote a course on this, and 
I also did multi-class classification in regress numeric regression, so you can see that. Uh, I want to thank Develop Denver for letting me talk, and thank you all for laughing at my corny jokes. Um, if you want to find out more about AML, the ABS documentation is great. I wrote a video course, as I mentioned, and then this code, which includes things like recreating a data source. If you have new data, if it's time series data, you probably want to recreate the data source and recreate the model. You can automate all that just driving the API. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. You're saying you say every prediction you have to ask the Amazon for the model that you want, and then you're charged each time. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's I think it's like a one cent for every ten thousand predictions, or something like that. So it's not very much. I think they might round up. Like I'm probably paying one cent right now for what I did, but yeah, that's the learning and the compute time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not. Um, yeah, so the actual predictions, it's, it's, I think it's one cent for every 10,000 predictions is what you what you pay for. No matter what data set, how much data Nope, as long as it's under that. Yep, one cent, so you, the, 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 what you pay for large data sets is the 42 cents to like churn through it and make it.